Hi, this is Charles Goldfarb at Washington University, and I'm sharing a patient and our treatment of that patient with Madelung's deformity. In this case, we perform a dome osteotomy, and you can see radiographically this 17-year-old female has classic features of Madelung's deformity with misshapen distal radius and prominent distal ulna. This is the patient's right arm extended on the arm table. You see we have uh, marked her skin where we plan to make a volar radial incision. That incision is similar to the incision we use for distal radius fractures where we are approximately at the flexor carpe radialis tendon. Incision is made longitudinally and neurovascular structures are identified and a bovi cautery is used as necessary. We do keep an eye out for the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve. It's not identified specifically in this patient. And as we're dissecting more deeply, we do see the radial artery on the radial side, and then we come a bit more ulnarly, and we find the FCR tendon. We open the FCR tendon sheath, as we typically do for a distal radius approach. And we retract the FCR in either direction, whichever is most straightforward. Divide the floor of the FCR sheath to expose the deeper structures. These patients tend to have a bit more fat than we often see in this exposure. And we release the distal sheath as necessary and the proximal sheath as necessary and retract the finger flexors more ulnarly. We sweep the soft tissues out of the way. I use Holman retractors liberally to assist in the exposure. Again, here we are further releasing the FCR tendon to improve our exposure. You can see the muscle belly of the flexor pollicis longus there and more deeply the pronator quadratus. The pronator quadratus is divided longitudinally. We do not typically have enough tissue for repair of the pronator quadratus. We elevate it subperiosteally, again using our Holman retractors to expose the distal radius. On the ulnar side, we typically encounter Vickers ligament. In this patient who is 17 years of age, it's not so necessary to divide or remove Vickers ligament, but I wanted to show where that was, and you'll see it here and a bit later in the video where Vickers ligament typically lies. The volar ulnar aspect of the distal radius does not form completely, and it's filled in with soft tissue, which some believe is an expansion of the short radiolunate ligament. Now we are drawing our planned dome osteotomy. The dome can be apex distal or proximal. In this case, I make it distal. I believe the apex of the uh, dome osteotomy is closest to the deformity. We want to protect the DREJ or at least what exists of the DREJ. And that's how we design our dome. This is a three-dimensional dome, as you will see. Here I'm further releasing Vickers ligament, just for exposure and demonstration purposes primarily. The thick white stuff is abnormal. That is not the DREJ. It is the thickened Vickers. In younger patients, you often expose the proximal aspect of the lunate during excision of Vickers ligament, but I've never seen a case of instability. So once we have our exposure, we perforate the volar cortex of the distal radius using irrigation as necessary to prevent overheating with a 0.45 Kirshner wire. I do take care to avoid over retraction, especially the ulnar homan can put pressure on the median nerve, so we are relaxing it intermittently. We then connect our dots volarly using a straight osteotome, piercing the volar cortex, 
and creating our dome shape from radial to ulnar. Once that is complete, we used a curved osteotome, starting with the osteotome parallel to the forearm and elevating the osteotome to create a volar to dorsal dome shape as well. You have to be a bit careful when you perforate the dorsal cortex to protect the extensor tendons and the musculature. You have to be careful not to create an apex or a rooftop at the center of the dome, else it's hard to manipulate the fragments. The smoother your dome, both radial to ulnar and volar to dorsal, the easier it is to position the distal radius once the osteotomy is complete. So ironically, that's exactly where it's supposed to shift from a dorsal volar stand. Still some dorsal cortex. So what you can see now is we're completing the osteotomy. And to a certain degree, the distal fragment assumes a more natural position almost automatically what you can see is the distal fragment slides dorsally and now we will manipulate the fragments until we're happy with them. So the distal fragment's dorsal, but I don't like its radial ulnar translation. I want the distal fragment to slide a bit more radially and what that does is it decreases the radial inclination angle to a more appropriate angle. Typically, if a homin is placed on the proximal fragment radially and the distal fragment ulnarly, one can manipulate those two homins and therefore manipulate the relationship between the fragments. Of course, you have to assure there's no soft tissue attachments. And here we're releasing a bit more of the Vickers ligament to accomplish that goal. And another homin. In some patients, this is very straightforward and takes about a minute. In other patients, as you can see here, we have to work a little harder. So now we are producing the floor. We did, I know. Now we can't get it back there. I don't know if it's the correction in two planes, which is which is the problem. That broke something up. Okay. I know. Yeah. So now we have translated the distal fragment radially. We've translated the distal fragment more dorsally, and you can see the correction in the volar prominence of the proximal fragment. And now we're going to secure this with K-wires. I use K-wires only, no matter the age of the patient. First, K-wires placed percutaneously from the radial styloid across our osteotomy into the proximal fragment. Obviously, with translation of the fragments, you have to be precise. And then, in an effort to minimize irritation of the radial sensory nerve, we make a small incision, spread, assure the nerve is not directly in line, and then place our second K-wire. That's bone, isn't it? Yeah. Same, same trajectory, but more distant. Coming up, I'd go closer. Yeah, right there. Try to avoid making the K-wires parallel, but they can be relatively close to that. It's a little tricky to place them, again, with the translation of the fragments. And once you have successfully placed your K-wires, there's very good stability of the osteotomy, and this together with a bowler splint is usually sufficient for mobilization. So here you can see improvement of the radial inclination angle on the PA view, and you can see the volar translation of the, or I should say dorsal translation of the distal fragment. Here we are limiting the cortical prominence of the proximal fragment and using some of that just to add a, a little bit of additional bone graft. Probably not necessary, but certainly doesn't hurt. These heal easily and well and quickly. Usually by five weeks are completely healed. Thank you.